Hello and welcome to Fur, Fins, and Feathers. This is our 82nd episode, and today our guest is Tony DeJesus of Big Blue Bug Solutions. Tony, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here, Brian. And we're very happy to have you. There is so much to discuss. Yes, yeah, a lot. So Just how do we start? Could you give us a little background sure. about You've been in the business for how long? 45 years. 45 years. 45 years, and uh, my field of expertise is structural pest control and, and pests around the yard and our homes. Okay. Now, we're coming up this weekend, hard to believe, Memorial Day weekend already. People are going to be spending a lot of time outdoors, and one of the problems in the summer months are ticks. They're I had one crawl problem. up my leg this afternoon. See? You know, and if, was it one of the larger ticks, the dog tick, or was it one of the smaller ones? A or, small tick. Yeah, small tick. Could have been a deer tick, one of the carriers of Lyme disease and other diseases like anaplasmosis and babesiosis. But, um, you know, on your leg, that's a, on the pants leg, that's a good place for it. You don't want it on your body. How can people be more attentive to, where's it, what should they be looking for? Yeah, you know, and, and everybody seems to think like you have to be out in the woods to get Lyme disease or to get these ticks on you, but you don't. I myself contracted Lyme disease a year and a half ago. I was out of my yard doing my fall cleanups, came in, took a shower, and I had been doing it for like three or four days, came in, took a shower, and I never do this, but I came out of the shower without my shirt on. I walked past my wife and she said, hey, you have a spot on your back. I said, what do you mean a spot? She said, it's like a red mark. So I couldn't see it myself and I'm trying to look at it in the mirror. So I said, take a picture of it and show me the picture. She took a picture of it and I says, that's the rash from being bitten by a deer tick. I said, I have to call my doctor. And I called the doctor and they put me on a series of antibiotics. Caught it early enough so never had any complications or problems. But I had the beginnings of Lyme disease and just working in my backyard. Not out in the woods, not out camping or hiking or fishing or anything like that. So what should people do? Okay. You can't prevent it from, from having a tick on you, but what should people do? Yeah. A couple of things you should do, and, and something that I now do, and I'm, especially when I'm working in the yard in amongst where the, the heavy brushes and the, and the uh, plantings and flowers and things, is I spray my pants uh, with, with a repellent, uh, with a repellent, something with DEET in it, works very well, in my skin. And I wear gloves and a long sleeve shirt whenever possible. I mean, in the middle of the summer when it's August, it's 100 degrees and you don't, but you've got to put insect repellent on yourself. And something with DEET works very, very well. If you want something that's more of a natural product, uh, lemon oil of eucalyptus works very well as a repellent. But people don't realize that around our homes, you know, we could still have ticks. And ticks like the shade areas. And they don't like, they're not out in the middle of your lawn. So don't think you have to spray your lawn to get rid of ticks. Ticks aren't out in the middle of the lawn unless one happened to fall off an animal that came through a yard. That's, they don't like direct sunlight. They like the shade areas, the brush areas, and that's where you want to be very careful when you're working in those areas. What, uh, you said ticks and other insects. What are some other insects? Well, the other insect, of course, you're gonna worry about at this time of year are mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. And, and whether you're a person or whether you're a dog owner, because mosquitoes carry hotworm, they can make the dog sick, but also the, the things that the mosquitoes you have to worry about are like Triple E in particular, which is a very serious disease and very prevalent in southeastern Massachusetts. We have more cases of it in southeastern Mass than we do in other areas. It's not as prevalent as some of the other diseases, but uh, you know, malaria uh, is really not a United States problem, but overseas in the, in the areas like Africa and South America, malaria takes hundreds of thousands of lives every year. But we're lucky here in the United States, we get ahead of it. You know, many of the cities and towns pre-treat pre uh, pre -treat their waterways. But around our own homes, for both ticks and mosquitoes, both insects love moisture. They need a lot of moisture. So things like leaf litter, either leaf litter in our garden areas or around in between our shrubs should be removed. Because under that leaf litter is where the deer ticks and the ticks will hide, the dog ticks and the other ticks. Up in our gutters, where the water gathers and the leaves can back the gutters up, that's where mosquitoes will breed. And even like in our plantings and around our yard, you should have some, you shouldn't let it get too overgrown. When it gets overgrown, that's where the ticks like to be. And those ticks will climb up on the tips of the plants or the high grass and they do what's called questing. They stick their front legs out and they wait as something walks by, whether it's an animal or a person, and they just grab on. 
and now they've hitched a ride with you and then they try to get under your clothing so that they can get to some skin because they are blood feeders. Very good. What should people be looking for w w with their dogs and cats? Yeah, with the dogs and cats, you know, uh, typically, if you have a dog like mine, I have a small dog, a doctor, and she goes in and out real quick. But if she's spending a little more time, every now and then on a nice cool day, she goes out and she goes between. When I see her in the, the areas where my shrubs are and where my heavy plantings are and things, when she comes in, I will immediately check her over to start to look to make sure I don't see anything like that, see any ticks on her. Uh, also an area with, for fleas and stuff like that. But around my home, some of the things you can do, again, is make sure your gutters are kept clean. Rainwater uh, can gather in areas. If you have areas that puddles, or I'm an avid bird feeder, my wife and I, we have a bird bath too. I was going to ask you about bird baths. Bird baths. I, every other day, I drum, dump that bird bath out, and I take the hose, and I power wash it, clean it all out really well, and then refill it with clear water because I don't want that stagnant water to sit there where mosquitoes will lay their eggs and start to breed. And mosquitoes, believe it or not, Brian, only need a cap full of water to breed. Then they don't need a lot. So if you store like your recyclables outside and they're only picked up every week or every two weeks, you know, and rainwater develops in the cans or anything, and it sits there, mosquitoes can breed there. So you've got to be very careful maybe to keep those things covered. I know in East Providence now we have the big trash bins, the blue ones, that all the recyclables go in there and they have a cover on them. So at least it's preventing them from getting wet and the rainwater from developing in there. Rainwater is an enemy to, uh, or, uh, an enemy to us, but a plus for mosquitoes and ticks for breeding. They love moisture. What are some other common insects that we should avoid? Well, one of the things right now at this time of year, because they're just starting and this is the time to get them, are hornets and wasps. You know, many people have severe allergies to them. You know, it can be stung and, and can create things. But the nests right now, you know, right in the beginnings and the middle of May, are about the size of a maybe golf ball to a baseball. So they're small in size. But if you wait until the end of the summer and you start to see something, now all of a sudden you have a nest that the inside of the nest can look something like this. And each one of those holes you see is a hornet or wasp that came out of there. So a nest, one of those large nests that you see at the end of the summer, those big paper nests and the trees that are hanging there, could have like a thousand hornets or wasps in them. And the last thing you want to be doing at that time is to be coming by with the weed whacker or the lawnmower or doing some repair work on the house and hammering and you disturb the nest and all of a sudden they come down on you and you have a very serious problem. You could be problem. hurt. Absolutely, very easily hurt. And you know, it, it's not necessarily you know, for the average person, one sting that'll bother you, but multiple stings can really affect you. But if you have the allergy, you should be carrying an EpiPen with you. And if you don't know if you have an allergy, I would go get tested. You know, you can go see an allergist and they can go. And if you can't, because if you don't know and you have the allergy and you get stung, that one sting can create some really dramatic effects on you. I mean, it can, it can be fatal in some cases. That's good to know. You know, people go into anaphylactic shock and it can really hurt them. And um, we had an, an incident where we have a, uh, one of the uh, managers of Big Blue Bug Solutions years ago, his son-in-law was coaching soccer and he had a soft drink. And it was during the fall when these insects are changing over their diet and going for carbohydrates. And he set the soft drink down on the bench while he's watching his game and he goes over now to get a sip of soda. And a wasp had gone inside so he takes the swip into his mouth got stung on the back of his tongue started to swell immediately they had to call the rescue and take him to the hospital you know he started to choke he couldn't breathe so you know now is the time to get the nest when they're small you know look inside your bushes look at your trees look up at the soffit areas of the house the overhangs that's where they attach a lot of these and they and, and they start off small so it's better to knock them down when they're small and take care of them then than when you have to deal with them, with, like I said, when you've got over 1,000 or 2,000 of them in so that nest. So what you're really telling people is they need to be proactive. Yes, absolutely. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, though, that old expression. Well, yes, get out there, do that preventative stuff. I always tell people, it's good once in a while to take a look around your house. You know, it's a, you know how often do you actually go outside, take a look, look up at the same, you know, maybe you see something as simple as, a screen that's broken, you know, that, that's ripped a little bit, that can let flies and mosquitoes in in the heat of the summer. 
or maybe you see that you've got some damage over the winter that you didn't realize, maybe from an ice dam or maybe snow or something, and your gutter is hanging down or there's an opening in the soffit area that could let animals in or could let insects in to build their nests. You know, keeping an eye on a house and, and you, you'll notice changes. If you look at your house regularly, all of a sudden you'll say, I, I didn't see that before. Or maybe you see a shadow that you didn't see before. You go up and look and sure enough, there's a nest going on up there or maybe it's spider webbing that's hanging out up there. Someone recently called me with regard to coming uh, for you to come on the show and wanted to talk about bees. What advice do you have for bees? Okay. Now, about bees. Yeah. Now, bees are very valuable to us, you know, as, as, as people that, um, you know, like the garden and, and have flowers and things like that in your yard. You need bees, honeybees. But you don't want to nest them in your house. So a lot of times they will take advantage of a small hole or maybe the space between our chimneys and the, and the house, that little crack to develop, and they start to get in there. And if it is the true honeybee, that honeybee is now building a nest and is eventually going to bring honey in there. So one of the things people can do is, if you notice that, is to call a beekeeper. Many beekeepers can come out and get into that area and literally vacuum those bees out of there. Then the big problem, if it's later in the season, is you're going to have to remove that honey. Because if you don't remove it, it'll get rancid, it can draw other insects to it, it'll smell, it'll run down sometimes and stain things. But getting a professional beekeeper involved works really well. Or if you need to get a professional pest control company involved, if you're afraid, you know, many of these nests can be taken by themselves, done at night, you know, not necessarily the honeybees because you don't want to kill those unless you absolutely have to. But for the um, wasps and hornets, you do that in the evening when the nest is small, the average homeowner can do something like that if they're not afraid and they're very careful. What about, um, I, and I'm losing my memory here, uh, ants. Yes, ants at this time of the year are really a problem because they're starting to come out and it's still a little early in the season so some of their natural food is not available outside. So now they come indoors. What would be natural food for an ant? Other insects. Um, organic materials, spillages and things like that that are outside, depending on the species of ant. Um, they, they eat other insects, they eat dead insects. So um, some of them feed off of a honeydew secretion in our trees created by aphids that live in the trees. They create a, a sweetness that they secrete and the ants will come and literally feed on it. And in some instances like carpenter ants, they'll literally farm the aphids and, and protect their area where there are aphids that they can get the secretion from without killing the aphids. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So how do you prevent that from happening? A couple of things you could do. And the main thing is, you know, all insects have a part in our general environment. I mean, you know, they're all vital in some way in the ecosystem. Uh, Disney uh, used the term the circle of life. You know, and it starts with the insects and works all the way around to the larger animals. Well, with ants, one of the things you want to do is, you know, you can give them the yard and the back area away from where you spend the time, but you don't want them in your home. So you can put a barrier around the outside of your house, uh, like you can use a barrier of insecticide granulas uh, that you can sprinkle around. If you want to use a, a natural product, uh, you can buy diatomaceous earth, which is a good natural product that you can sprinkle around outside. Right along your foundation, you make a barrier from the foundation out about three feet, or you can spray the outside of your house. You can go to one of the big box stores and buy it. There's a number of different good brands of ant spray on the outside. One of the things I advise people to do is when you're spraying, try to get that spray like underneath the first row of shingles. Get it right, or clapboards, get it up underneath there. That way the rain doesn't wash it away. It'll last a lot longer. And you can put a barrier around down the bottom too, but you get that barrier underneath that first row of shingles and the rain runs right off and it doesn't affect it at all. It'll last a long time there. What are some other insects that people should be wary about? Well, Two of the things that uh, I, I think, you know, our home is our biggest investment that we're ever going to make, at least I know for my, me it was. And the things you have to worry about are the insects that are going to do damage to your home, and particularly termites and carpenter ants. Now, we're lucky where we live here in southern New England because we only have one species of termite. If you live down south, they have uh, dampwood termites and drywood termites and famosan termites. Up here, we have one termite called the eastern subterranean termite. Subterranean means it lives in the ground. So anywhere... There's not a community in southern New England that does not have termites. 
So what you have to do is you have to take a look at your house every once in a while and look at the wood around the outside of your house. When you, if you're working in the garden or you're digging around your flower beds, look and see, do you see anything that looks like little tiny white ants going through, or cream colored ants going through the mulch? That could be your first sign of termites. And termites feed on the wood. They actually get nourishment from the wood and they can digest it. And when termites are feeding on the wood, now this is a solid beam of wood. We cut out actually from one of the support beams in someone's structure. And all insects damage wood. Termites, carpenter ants, potipos, they damage wood with the grain of wood. So if you're looking at your wood damage and it's with the grain of wood, termites leave a mud tunnel, mud traces in the wood. The wood looks very dirty when it's been eaten by termites. And um, as opposed to an insect called a carpenter ant that I'll talk about in a second, carpenter ants do very clean damage. They got the name carpenter ant because it kind of looks like a carpenter went through that wood and finally sanded it and everything and made it look good. But the termite is getting its nourishment from the wood, but it comes from out of the ground to feed on our wood. And termites can cause a lot of damage. A lot they? of damage. Yes, they can. Absolutely. A lot of structural damage. And they sometimes damage the wood right up to the point to where they come through. So you don't necessarily know they're in there. We call them the silent invaders. You don't see them because they're not feeding on anything else but the wood. So they've come up out of the ground. And one of the things to look for are what we call mud tunnels. And a mud tunnel will come from the soil up, up your foundation. And sometimes it, it, they're sneaky. They go between the cracks where your steps, the foundation of the steps and the house foundation, they're poured separately. And there's that crack and they get up behind that kick plate. They feed on wood there. So once in a while, take a good look. Poke at the wood a little bit, easy with a screwdriver. You don't want to damage your house, but a little bit with a screwdriver. Does it feel spongy? Does it feel soft? At that point, termites are one of the one, it's probably the only insect that I will tell you that if you're having a problem with it, you need to get a professional involved because the ground then has to be treated, the soil. You're not going to get rid of termites by just spraying the foundation like you do with ants or spraying the inside of the house or the outside of the house. Termites, you, they have to dig a small trench. And when I say small, I mean down about 12 inches. And they dig a small trench. They flood that with a termiticide, and then they rod the soil to get down to the footing. And when a proper termite application is done like that, it can last for years. And it'll give your house good protection. And, you know, that's where our big money is spent. Now, as opposed to the termite, which eats the wood and, and gets nourishment from it, the carpenter ant chews on the wood but throws the sawdust aside. So one of the signs of carpenter ants is if you break open a piece of wood, it'll be very clean inside. There won't be any mud. But also, you see carpenter ants. They're the larger ants you see either in your backyard or crawling around once in a while and in your house. And people always say, oh, I saw a carpenter ant today in my what house. What color are they? They're black to a reddish. They can even be a, a reddish brown or they can be black and red. They can be like three different, three different okay. colors depending on, on the ant itself. But they can be different sizes, too. They have what's called major workers and minor workers. Termites are all the same size, but much smaller, like a quarter the size of a carpenter ant, very small. But carpenter ants will enter our home, and once in our home, they'll look for hollow wall voids first if they can, or if not, they take advantage of moist wood. For both the termite and the carpenter ant, and this is why it's so important for the homeowner, that if they have a leak or get a leak, to get it fixed, to get it repaired as soon as possible. And if the wood is damaged, get the wood repaired too. Because that wood, if they don't do it, it's soft. It's like a carpenter or a trimmer. It's like a piece of filet mignon. You know, that's, a, that's a good piece of meat for them to feed on. And they will take advantage of that. And cause ser serious damage. Serious damage. Very serious damage. Now, one thing is... Yes, you, you showed me the... <laughs> This is fascinating. It really is. Now, you, you think about it, and wood is what we get paper from, how we make paper. And this is a book, a, a cookbook, as it says, that was damaged by termites. And uh, the particular homeowner that had this had a bookshelf down in their basement. The basement wasn't finished. There was a crack in the basement that they didn't realize behind the big bookshelf. And the termites came through the back and started feeding on some of them, and it wasn't until they needed a book that they went to get it that they found the damage. And, um, and that is a significant amount of damage. It really is. You can see, you know, they, they ate a good third of this book. And it was, um, you know, just fascinating to watch them. And we opened the book up. They were in, actually inside their feeding. 
And again, as I said with the mud that was in the wood, same thing here. You can see the mud all inside here. That's one of the things termites do is they carry that mud up to protect themselves. The termite's body is about 80% moisture, so they dry up and die very easily. So they need that mud to keep things cool, to keep things moist for them. So they carry that mud around and, and build their mud tunnels that way. So people need to do an examination around the house, but inside as well. Yes, inside and outside. Down in the basement is where a lot of things start. Because if, particularly if your basement is unfinished, but even if it's finished, basements tend to be damper, tend to be cooler, so they're much more conducive for insect activity. So to go downstairs once in a while, if your basement is unfinished but you have storage against the basement, move that storage away a little bit. I had a good friend of mine, I, um, one of my hobbies is collecting sports memorabilia, baseball cards and things like that. And he called me one day all distressed. He had his baseball card, some of his collection, in cardboard boxes, stored down in his basement up against the wall. Termites came through, went through the cardboard, and started to eat some of his baseball card collection. You know, Which are valuable. He had, some of his were very valuable, yes they were. So we had a lot of damage to win. And these weren't like in plastic sleeves or anything, these were ones in complete sets and you know, they went right through the cardboard and right through the basement. And again, that, that's soft wood to them. It's, you know, it's very tender. It's easy for them to feed on paper products. What are some other? Some of the other things to be concerned things with. Things that people should look for. Yeah. At, at this time of year, um, when, when working in your yard, you notice that there's little holes in the yard periodically. You know, you wake up in the morning, it's like something's digging in my yards. It may be that you're having a problem with grubs in the lawn. And that's usually a skunk, raccoon, a possum, one of the nighttime creatures that come in, and they sense the grub, which is a fat worm, and the skunk will dig in there to feed on that. So that's one of the other things, and what you need to do is either, yourself, you can go to, again, one of the big box stores or a garden store and get grub control products that you need to apply. You need a lawn spreader, um, and you need to be able to measure out properly how much you have, because you don't want to under apply and you don't want to over apply either so you know grub control is usually done by the square footage of the yard the application length times foot of your lot and grubs are fat worms they're fat little white worms and if you don't know if you have grubs and you want to know if you get a good sharp shovel a good sharp spade or, or, a, or a flat spade um, take like a, a maybe a one foot square dig around a little bit and just roll it back gently so you can put it back down roll it back gently if you don't see any of those white worms in there you know, you're in pretty good shape if you do that in a couple of spots in your lawn. But if all of a sudden you see some of your lawn is browning and it's burnt and you know you're watering it on a regular basis, that could be grubs because grubs eat the roots of the lawn. And one of the other things you can do is if you have a thick lawn is you grab the grass and pull on it. And if it comes up a little bit like a rug, like it's been, you know that the roots have been now cut away from the soil and that's usually grub damage and you need to get some type of grub control done on the lawn. And there is no way to, you have to do something. You have you to, have do, to something. do an application. Uh, right, otherwise you're going to lose the lawn eventually. I mean, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It'll take a while. But, you know, if, if you like to have a nice yard, a nice looking yard, then you do it. I mean, if you don't care about the lawn, you know, there are a lot of people that don't care. And they like the natural look and the weeds and things in the yard. If, if that's okay, you, need, you don't have to do anything. But if, if you don't do anything, eventually you're going to start doing it. And then eventually you're going to start getting those animals coming into the yard, digging, looking for those grub worms. Well, I've got you here before we uh, end this segment. I want to ask you about the big blue bug. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about it. It still yeah. talks about yes, it. It's been Talk in, about you. it. it it's really fascinating. It, it's been up there uh, since 1980 when we put it up, when we first, when we first um, moved to that location. We used to be in Oneyville in Providence. We moved to this location right off the freeway, and the president of that time, Leonard Goldman, and his son, Stephen, wanted to do something to, to announce our arrival. And they thought about different things to put on the roof. Termites are a big part of our business. The big blue bug is a termite. So they put the termite up on the roof. And I mean, we could have never imagined how famous it would become. I mean, it's been on Oprah Winfrey. It's been in books. It's been in the movies. It's, it's been in so many different things. And you know- Many transitions with different colors though. Right, yes, it did. Um, and, and that was the thing. If, if you ever get a trivia car, you go to a trivia, place and they asked you what was the original color of the big blue bug it was purple it was originally purple the sun faded it blue we painted it the sun faded it again to the blue color and by that time 
the traffic reporters that people were starting to refer to the big blue bug. And you know, that has a much better sound to it than the big purple bug. You know, the big blue bug, you have that alliteration and it's, you know, it's become famous. I mean, we've had people come here from Australia, from uh, the Netherlands, from Africa, and they, they come to Providence to visit and they want to see the bug up close. You know, so we'll put a ladder and let them get up on the roof and take a picture with the bug if they want to. You know, they have to sign waivers and things. But I mean, we've actually, we've had um, people, our service people serving, serving overseas and, in, in, you know, on, on ships out of the Navy, family requests, you know, do you have anything? Do you have a t-shirt? Do you have a hat we could send? And we, you know, we send pictures and, and a hat to, them, to, to our service people too. And it's not far from Rhode Island Hospital. No, it's not right so around the corner. So it's a landmark. It is. It really is. It's right. And it's the most traveled part of of I ninety five in Providence in, in Pawtucket. It's it's the, the major thoroughfare. So it, it's it's uh, it's our best for, best advertising. You know, we can spend money on TV and radio and stuff, but the the big blue bug is the best advertising. And people people widely recognize it. They really do. And and it was interesting. A few years ago, we had to refurbish it. So we took it off the roof. And we get this call from a gentleman who's in Attleboro, Mass. And he says, hey, what happened to the bug? He said, I was looking for 195 East. He said, I'm going down to the Cape from New York. And people said, right after you see the bug, you're going to be making a turn onto 195. And that's what we had to tell him. I'm sorry we took it down to be refurbished. So uh, it, it had a nice facelift and a, a couple of times now we've had to do it and just repaint it up and make it look good. But it is definitely a Rhode Island landmark. Yeah, it really is. Matter of fact, when um, they were looking for things to put on the state quarters, the Big Blue Bug was one of the things they considered. <laughs> well, Tony, it's been fabulous. I've enjoyed I've being I've really here, enjoyed having you. And we are going to take a break. And then we will see episode 83. All right. But it's been fun. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.